Hi there everyone and welcome to the Novel Novel Strip Show. Um, this is part two of my wrap up for uh, standalone September, that's September just gone, September 2018. Um, if you haven't seen the first part yet, please do go and watch that, I'll link it up now. And I'm just going to carry straight on with my review of the books that I read last month. Um, so, I, after reading uh, First 15 Lives of Harry August, I went on to read Wonderstruck by Brian Selznick. Um, so for a brief summary, we follow two stories in this book. So one is about a girl called Rose, um, and her story is told mainly through images. Um, and the other is about a boy named Ben. His story is initially told mainly in text. And then at the end, um, we kind of swap with text and images, and their two stories converge. Um, in terms of what I, I thought, I absolutely love this book to bits. Um, and to be honest, I kind of now want to get everything that Brian Selznick has ever done. Um, I think the way in which the story is told is incredibly unique in terms of the style of the drawings. Um, they're nothing like I've ever seen in a picture book. They're not um, bright colours and bold lines like comics. Um, similarly, they're not kind of si simplified and um, sort of bold, si uh, simplistic shapes as they might be in a children's book. Um, they're all done in graphite, so they're just, yeah, in pencil. Um, he Brian Selznick has a very unique style where he... Um, uses uh, cross hatching and so there's a great sense of contrast within the images um and yeah he, he uses hatching to achieve that and it's they're just beautiful it's every page is a, a treat to look at um and so because of that i'm sure young readers would definitely enjoy the book and love the book um but in terms of the kind of universal theme of the book it's it's very much family friendship and a sense of kind of wanting to belong in a sense of how we experience the world so i truly believe anyone of any age will enjoy that and even in terms of the illustration um it's it's so well done and it's so beautiful that um it's it's definitely not just for kids anyone of any age can enjoy them um so there is a little spoiler here um that the the book does feature deaf characters um so first of all that really intrigued me because i don't believe i've ever read a book with a deaf character in it before um when we, when i think about diversity i often think about lgbt characters and people of of different ethnic ethnicity sorry um but i'd never really thought about you know i, I don't believe i've ever read a book with a blind character in it before i don't believe i've ever read um an a, a book with a character that has a hearing impairment in it before um but this one did um so that was quite fascinating but what makes it even more special is that um that's part of the reason why images are employed um so rather than just have images for the sake of of having images and have one of the stories told mainly through images um the advantage to that or the reason behind that is that it allows us to experience the deaf characters' world in the same way that they do it. So words are largely absent, and we just have kind of sight to go on. We have to find out what's happening within this character's world by looking at things, and that's exactly what that character has to do as well, because the character's deaf. Um, so it wasn't, even though it was amazing, and to be honest, the illustrations are so beautiful, that even if they hadn't had that element to them, um, I, w I would have still loved the book, and I would have loved the story. But it just added an extra layer, just added it, it, it just made it even more unique and even more well thought out. Um, so, yeah, it was, it was a brilliant book. Um, can't wait to get more by Brian Selznick. I honestly couldn't recommend it highly enough. Um, I gave it five out of five stars and it's definitely on my favourite shelf as well. So that's kind of the level up that I have. I might give a book five stars, but only really special books um, get put on my favourite shelf. And this one, yeah, definitely made it there. So everyone should go and read it now. Um, next up then, I read, well, I didn't actually read this one, I audio booked Norse Mythology by Neil Gaiman. Um, so in one of my previous videos, I went on about how I felt bad spending 2 99 on the book because it's more than I would normally spend on a book. Um, and I got much bigger books for cheaper that day. Um, and yeah, in the end, it was kind of pointless because I ended up just audioing the, the entire book. Um, so yeah, in terms of the, the story, um, obviously there are lots of different stories told within it. Basically, it's just Neil Gaiman um, retelling several stories that come from Norse mythology. Um, so in terms of, of my enjoyment of the book, um, I, I definitely did enjoy it. Um, and I think it was quite 
unique obviously listening to it as an audiobook and um, because it's narrated by Neil Gaiman and um, so on the one hand I think it's good because um, a lot of the first part is him talking about uh, the writing and his connection to Norse mythology so it definitely gave it that more personal tone um, it was his own words his own experience direct from his mouth um, and so yeah that that was great it added that element to it um, and also it was able to see you know how he envisaged each of the characters how he saw each of the gods um, and the voice that he you know gave to them um, again through his own words through his own mouth not just his writing um, so yeah that was great um, on the other hand though it was slightly off-putting um, sometimes as he's got quite a unique accent it kind of swings halfway between British and American he is British originally but I think he's lived in America for quite a while so it seems like a bit of that kind of gets pulled in as well and it becomes kind of I think it's described as mid-Atlantic um, not many people seem to have that accent fortunately because it is a bit um, off-putting for me anyway um, but um yeah, that's quite a, a minor point, to be honest. Um, in terms of, yeah, the, the actual stories, um, I don't really know anything about Norse mythology. This, for me, was very much an introduction to it. Um, and I think it was a really good um, and enjoyable way to get into Norse mythology. I definitely want to find out more about it. Um, I study classics, so I'm um, pretty knowledgeable in terms of Roman and Greek mythology. Um, after that, Possibly, you know, Egyptian a little bit. I'm definitely no expert, but um, I know a, a decent amount um, when it comes to Norse mythology that I didn't know anything. Um, so, yeah, this was um, a, a definite, um, definitely a good introduction, um, I feel. Um, one thing that annoyed me slightly is that um, some of the gods do employ quite a lot of slang. Um, and I, I understand that this is, um, you know, to give kind of an extra level to the characters um so for example with um thor um the language that he uses makes him seem quite you know oakfish and kind of all brawn no brains um which you know i get i get why why neil gaiman did that um and, and certainly in the way that you know he he changes his voice he doesn't really put on um kind of character voices too much it very much all sounds like him um his voice isn't particularly distorted but you can tell the speech patterns and everything do change with characters, which is great. That's, you know, what I look for in a book because it enables me to um, picture the characters with a unique voice. Um, but I just felt for kind of almighty gods, it just, it, it, lo it lost some of its authenticity. Um, there's already a bit of authenticity lost when, you know, they're kind of, not speaking old Norse and stuff like that um and it just yeah felt like the when when language is manipulated in that way it just feels like these characters are being brought into our world um and you know if they use language that's very kind of informal and makes them seem like they're from a particular region of the UK that then takes them out of the world that they're meant to be in for me so that's why I find it a bit um problematic um and I, f I feel like that happens a lot within retellings. Um, so I think this suffered a little bit from that. But I think overall, though, um, Neil Gaiman is such a skilled writer that it, it didn't bother me too much. And I could still um, enjoy it. So, yeah, overall, I'll give it four stars um, and yeah, definitely recommend it. Um, next up, then, I read Purple Hibiscus by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Um, so this is her first novel and it follows 15 year old Kambili who's part of a wealthy Nigerian family which is kind of dominated by their very strict Catholic father Eugene. Um, so in terms of this book there now I really don't know if I'm going to be able to keep this video this part two uh, down to 15 minutes it might have to go into part three because I could go on and on basically about how much I love this book Um it really touched me quite profoundly and um yeah, I would definitely recommend it to pretty much anyone. Um, so I found it's it's quite a short book, but even so, I read it quite slowly because I really wanted to savour all of it. And I I didn't want it to end at all um, at, to the point where um, after I finished reading it, I had to stop myself going back and starting again from the beginning. I've never really felt that with a book, but this one definitely got me there. I just wanted to start again from the beginning, see what I'd missed, just 
be back in the world of the the characters of Cambelia and her brother, um, and that's quite that's saying something because it's it's quite a tough book. It really is. Um, I mean, there's there's physical violence, there's mental abuse, um, and there were definitely times when you know it it, it brought me to tears more than once. Um, but even so, I wanted to go and I wanted to be back with the characters that I, I truly felt I knew them, um, and especially the main character, Cambeli, like, she faces so much in the way that she's, you know, been brought up, I just wanted to give her a hug throughout the whole book, pretty much, I wanted to take her pain away, show her that there's, you know, there is something better there, I wanted to be that friend that she never really gets to have, um, and, yeah, so that was, uh, I felt a really strong connection with her, um, and because of that, yeah, that kind of drew me into the book and everything that happened in it. And that's exactly what I want out of a book. Um, but another thing that I particularly love on, on another level, kind of reflecting back, is the fact that all the, though her father, Eugene, he is abusive. Um, that's not his whole character. That's not how he's defined. It's not simply he's a, abusive. Why is he abusive? Well, he's a man. Um, so he has a very, very complex life um, and he does have in many many good qualities as well as this kind of domineering presence um he it's it's never so his, his behavior is never given an excuse the fact that he treats his home like a dictatorship is never portrayed as acceptable um and, but although his behavior is never justifiable it is explored so to some extent it's it's understandable um, and he's, yeah, as I said, such a complex and dynamic character. He's not just simply a big, bad, domineering man. He has many good qualities as well. He gives to charity, um, and a lot of people in the town see him as this this good figure because he he is, in many respects, genuinely, you know, a, a good person and does things that would be seen as, as morally good and selfless. Um, but he has this other side to him as well. He's not just a one-sided character, and that's why... I love this book so much because none of the characters is. They're all multifaceted, and especially with Eugene, um, I think this is you know something that's often not not explored in books. Um, so the fact that it was just made me love this book even more. Um, and yeah, especially with you know male characters who are abusive, um, there there's simply no justification for it other than well they're just a man, they're male, they're they're boorish, they're abusive, they, they have power, and they want to wield it, they don't want it to be taken away, um, I feel like you get that a lot in, in a lot of books that I have read, um, Girl on the Train is one example of that, that's why I didn't particularly enjoy it, um, so, yeah, because of this, I would say that kind of encapsulates the, the, the novel as a, a true feminist text, because it, it shows that, you know, strict gender roles, tie in with religion and culture and colonization and affect everyone um it's not you know just women who are affected it's not just men and obviously how the women in the book are affected is definitely explored as well um but the thing that i found particularly unique was how the male character um was explored um and yeah i love it um because of that again this is another one that um it's just this it's so complex in such a short text um and therefore i gave it five out of five stars and once again it went straight on to the favorite shelf um and as well as as the novel itself i think chima mandan goes dj is such an inspiration listening to you know endless kind of uh, i can't stop watching talks and interviews with her um on youtube um because she's she's completely fascinating the way in which she she says everything you feel like every single word has has meaning and she doesn't say anything um without thinking about it first and that's very much what you get in her writing as well um and as my partner put it um it's a, a direct quote um she's the most gloriously elegant and wonderfully direct speaker so erudite but at the same time she doesn't mince her words i'm incredibly impressed with her as a human being um, so yeah, I just couldn't have put it better myself, to be honest. Um, and I would strongly recommend watching interviews and talks with her, um, as well as reading her literature. So yeah, coming up to 15 minutes there. So I've got two books left. I'm actually going to talk about them in a part three. Um, so yeah, please tune in for that.